this is Mark Patterson, and welcome to the first episode of Finding Your Summit Rewind. So what we're going to be doing is offering podcasts that have been played in the past and putting them forward and getting updates on different people who have done amazing and incredible things. So the first one out of the gate is my best buddy in the world, Jim Mora, broadcasting live from Hermosa Beach. Jim, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, so we talked, gosh, six months ago, something like that. And at that time, we were going through kind of the chronological order of how you got into football. I know you came from a football family. Your dad was a longtime coach in the NFL for the Saints as a head coach and the Colts. And we just talked about goal setting about drive, about motivation, and about how you've navigated. And at that time, you were the head coach of the UCLA Bruins. <laughs> and so now we are, here we are, six months later, and it's just amazing you know, how things can change. And things Because can. I'm not the head coach of the UCLA Bruins. <laughs> because you're not the head coach. So let's just get the elephant out of the room right now. And I was there the day that, that all that stuff went down and, and not a fun thing to go through. And from your standpoint, and I'm going to ask you some obvious questions to start, but what was so disappointing about that? Well, it was disappointing on many, many levels. Number one, I think that you have to look inward first before you start to blame others. And I've done that. I think if you look at others to try to figure out what just happened to you, you make mistakes. So I think what's most disappointing is that I have not had the opportunity to complete the mission. And really the mission was a never-ending quest to help young kids, young men, find an avenue to success and along the way win games and create a great culture and environment for people to have success. And so I love to compete like you do. Uh, We love to set goals. We love to work hard to attain them. We love to push boundaries. We love to have standards that are higher than, you know, anyone could ever comprehend and to really kind of lose that ability to do those things for a certain point in time has been a real setback. Yeah, no, I can appreciate that. And you know what I've just continued to learn because I've had a number of setbacks in my life and I call them traversing, right? Where they happen and then you got to zig, you got to zag, you got to figure a way out of it and it's no fun. And But in every single one of these circumstances that's happened to me, I've always found there was some bright light at the end of that tunnel and there's some great lesson to be learned by that, right? So I go back to my own situation six, seven years ago when I was going through a tough period with my with my relationship with my now ex-wife. And even though she's a really good person, we just weren't connecting in the way that we needed to to connect with. And so my bucket was so flipping empty, I needed to do something about that. And what, what came out of that was this goal to become the first NFL guy to climb the seven summits. And at the time, there was no podcast and there was no newsletter and there was no Facebook and there was this there wasn't an opportunity to connect with you and Chris Long and other guys with Water Boys to go back down to Tanzania and climb that mountain and raise all that money for the people of the Maasai tribe. And so while I would have never wished this upon anybody, there's been so many blessings that have come out of this. And I see the same thing with you. You've got 25 years of NFL head coaching or NFL partially head coaching experience. And the last six years as the head coach guy at UCLA, and there are so many people that can benefit from your knowledge and from your goal setting and motivation and what you've learned that you can give them. I mean, I just see great things ahead for you. Well, I hope so. And I think it's all about attitude and perspective. And I think you work to the place that you are in now, but it's obviously it's a tough journey, but it's one you can't give up on. And as you said, there's going to be some valleys and there's going to be some peaks. And in some days, there's going to be many valleys and peaks. <laughs> and over a long time, there's going to be hopefully fewer valleys and and more peaks, but uh, it's a process. And I've been through it before. As a head coach in the National Football League, twice uh, was fired. They say as a coach in football or in professional sports in general, you're hired to get fired. So I've been through it before. And it has always taken me a little while to rebound, get my bearings back, and then progress forward. But I've always found a way to come out on the other side in a better place. And particularly this UCLA experience for me was an amazing six years. And the last two were difficult in terms of win-loss record, but I point to things that we did that were maybe more meaningful than the wins and losses on the field, such as taking a graduation success rate that was 59% when we got there and moving that needle to 86% when we left. Mm-hmm. Or you know having a 100% success rate with our, our student-athletes getting a job when they were done 
playing football or sending the most players in the Pac-12 into the NFL of any team in the Pac-12 or having the highest grade point average in the history of UCLA football. And all those things to me were just indicators of success in the program and the culture. And so while I came out of an environment in, in the NFL where I was desperately disappointed that I got released from the Seattle Seahawks, I regrouped, came into this UCLA job and found a new kind of uh, mission. And I think the same thing hopefully will happen again after this episode. Yeah, well, I think that there's no question that in my, or I should my, our good buddy, Hugh Millen, quarterback for the Huskies and long time in the NFL, we both agree that your personality might be better suited for college kids than yeah, they I are so. and really impact those guys so much in a deeper way. So, you when know, you can, you have the ability to shape lives rather than just, as I always say, the, the concrete hasn't hardened on who these young people are. We're in the NFL. You know, they're a little bit more into being men and the family. And at this point, you know, when they're high schoolers or just new in college, you can really help shape who they're going to become. Another UCLA great, Jerry Robinson, when I did a podcast with him, the first thing that came out of his mouth is I said, Jerry, how are you doing? And he goes, every day I wake up with an attitude of gratitude. So going back to what you were just saying, it just depends on what lens you want to look through. I mean, you've had an amazing life. You've been able to coach some incredible athletes and been around in some of the most crazy games with finishes, you know, that have been really exhilarating. And, you know, I know that path is still ahead for you. Um, something else that happened that not a lot of people know about, it was kind of double jeopardy for you. And again, the reason why I kind of giggle about this a little bit is because I really see you emerging out in a really positive way. But you were up skiing. It was the one time that you, one or two times, left you, you, behind. Actually, you left me behind. You didn't bring me to <laughs> Park City. We weren't there. And you like blew your knee out. And not just like blow it, blow it, but I mean, like seriously yeah. did amazing damage to it. Pretty, yeah. It was uh, called the tibial plateau fracture. So I have a plate and eight screws in there. For me, being active, one of the ways that I was able to refocus when I was going through adversity in the past was to push boundaries physically, you know, through exercise or activity, or as you know, you do climbing or hiking or skiing and just, you know, pushing myself to the limit like I would do in a competitive situation. So you call it double jeopardy and it kind of is, you're not having that outlet. It's been hard, but now I'm coming back from that. And then certainly, as you know, you go through a divorce. It's been a challenging year and there's days when you just, I don't know if I wake up with an attitude of gratitude every day, but they're becoming more more frequent. Well, I, I think it's still part of the process. And you wouldn't be human and wouldn't be real if you said you woke up every single day after going through some of this different stuff and you just bounce up and you're like hard charging. But at the same time, you know, I know you're a goal setter and I know you've got a lot of pearls of wisdom that you impart on other people. And, you know, the whole key, I think, a lot of times is try to really bring that back to yourself. And so if you were to give somebody else a pep talk, but now you're going to turn that around for yourself, what would that be? Well, I mean, I've given a gazillion pep talks and I keep notes and pictures and all kinds of things on my phone that, you know, I go back and revisit or I send to other people depending on the situation. And, you know, I just pulled the one up right here. And I think it's a, a great one for anyone that's experiencing some sort of success to realize, and, and this is not obviously my quote, but someone else's, that success is not owned, it is leased, and rent is due every day. And to me, that means that you know you may have success, be experiencing some success, but you need to keep your eye on the prize, you need to keep your nose to the grindstone. That doesn't mean you don't look up and you know look at what's going on around you, but you have to be concentrating on the task at hand or you can lose focus and and, and lose your path. And there, I just have so many. I just have so many different sayings that I love. Um, here's another one. Strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from an indomitable will. I have one here that I, that I love that talking about team attitude reflects leadership. I could go on and on and on and on and on. I mean, I just have a million things. And one that I've always kind of lived by I think it comes from John Gordon, who's a tremendous author and a very good friend of mine. But we all have an inner scoreboard that we keep track of how we are doing. And nobody else has privy to that scoreboard except for us. And we know if we're living the life that we intend to live or if we uh, are sacrificing our standards. And so it's just keeping track of your inner scoreboard. And 
Just one more. I'll give you one more. Exceptional success requires exceptional circumstances. And now you can say, well, that's getting a break. But sometimes, you know, exceptional circumstances mean going through some tough times like, you know, we have or I am or you have or anyone that's listening has. Well, John Gordon is coming up on the pod here in a couple of weeks. He so, is. He's, yeah, uh, have you met him yet? No, I've talked to him on the phone. He's, he, an, uh, he's an amazing guy. He's a really good friend of mine. Yeah, no, he's it's got great... Just, Great energy, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, he's just, yeah, he's something special. He's got a book out, something like The Positivity Bus. He's got, no, The Energy Bus. The energy he's bus, got yeah. about eight books out, and yeah, he, no. you are going to absolutely love him, and he's got a great story, and he's been through some things that he'll talk to you about and talk about on the pod. So if this is a commercial for the next podcast coming up with John Gordon, I can tell you from personal experience that you definitely want to tune in for that one because it's going to be epic. Well, listen, this was all about finding your summit, rewind, and part of that is getting caught up with people who've been on the pod before, and certainly you've had huge success, and you've also had a few bumps. A lot of yeah, bumps. Yeah, a lot with of With success comes bumps. It, let me say this. I have another saying here. If the road you're traveling has no bumps, it's not going anywhere or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember the exact words, but if the path is easy, it's probably not leading you to anywhere that is going to be rewarding. So there's going to be bumps in any road that, that's leading to success. I 100% believe that. I mean, nothing that was ever achieved that with greatness has come easy. So, no. yeah, I mean, it, it takes hardship and discipline. And many times there's uncertainty on the other side of that, right? You don't know how the outcome, even though you want to become the top guy, I mean, your path may or may not lead to coaching again. I don't know. I think that'd be a mistake, but I do know that you will affect others in a big time way into the future. So again, the name of this podcast is called Finding Your Summit Rewind. We wanted to get quickly caught up with you, Jim, and now let's go listen to the rest of the episode. Okay. Here we go. Hey, and welcome back to Finding Your Summit Podcast. This is Mark Patterson. And I am fired up because this week we have a great guest, Jim Mora Jr., head coach, UCLA football team, also a head coach in the NFL, and he's got a 25-year pedigree coaching in the NFL and is now going to do his sixth year with, again, the Bruins. So I uh, had a great conversation with Jim. We really went through the early days growing up, what it was like to be with his dad, Jim Mora Sr., and the different places that he moved around to. So stay tuned. It's a great interview, and let's do it. We are here at World HQ in Hermosa Beach, my recording studio, with my best friend, Jim Mora. So, Jim, I have to say I'm cheating just a little bit from the standpoint of a lot of the people that I will be interviewing going forward, I know, I, or I don't know, and I don't know the answers to a lot of their questions. But what I try to do today is I wanted to go back, and you're a guy of high achievement, and I uh, wanted to kind of go through your path. Uh, I think a lot of people know you as a coach, but they don't know your roots from growing up and whatnot. So... Why don't we start, you grew up in a football family, your dad was a head coach, Jim Mora, coach for the uh, New Orleans Saints and Indianapolis Colts. Tell us what it was like growing up. You didn't just grow up in Seattle. You're right. My dad was a coach, and so my entire life has really just been about one thing, and that's football. That's very simplistic because there's a lot of other things that are involved with, you know, being involved with football, but I would say this, that every meal that I've ever had, every piece of clothing I've ever bought has been paid for by football. My dad, you know, started his career at Occidental College, moved from there to University of Colorado. I'm sorry, went to Stanford, then University of Colorado, UCLA, University of Washington. Then he went to the Seattle Seahawks, the New England Patriots. Then he went to the Philadelphia Stars, the United States Football League, the New Orleans Saints, and uh, finished his career with the Indianapolis Colts. So those are a lot of moves for a young guy. Yeah. Right. So what was it like, though, for you? I mean, every time your dad would come home and, you know, there's like a new thing coming up, what was that like? Was that, were you like in shock? Were you like, Dad, I don't want to leave? Because kids like stability, as you know. Every move was different. You know, I can remember when I was six years old and my dad was at Occidental and being on the bus with him, going to games, and that was really fun. And the move to Stanford was nothing because we were young, and, it, and my brothers and I, and it, it didn't really affect us. The move to Colorado was exciting because uh, I was at an age where I kind of understood that we were moving. It was difficult. I remember the first day of school not wanting to go to school. 
And then after that, every move became a little bit more difficult. You know, as you get older, you want to have some roots and you're establishing friendships and they're deeper and more meaningful and to have to pull up roots and, you know, those relationships change, it can become very, very difficult. I was lucky, though, in that at age 12, I settled in Seattle and really never left. My dad moved on, but I, uh, you know, I stayed there and went to the University of Washington, as you know, and then started my own career from there. So my youngest brother, Stephen, as a matter of fact, kind of bore the brunt of, of more moves than I did. So when you're talking about Colorado, you're talking about the University of Colorado in Boulder. What a great spot. I've awesome. been with you uh, a number of times now to play the Buffaloes. But so you're starting now, you're what, seven, eight years old when you're there? I moved there when I was 11. When you're 11, okay. Yes. So now you're starting football, right? For yep. yourself. Yep. And what was Actually, that? Mark, I'm sorry. I moved there when I was seven. You're right. Yeah. I moved there when I was seven. And uh, we lived in Table Mesa. And that's when I started to play football. Yeah, because I think we start playing, I think, around 8 or 9. I played on yep. the 89ers, so I think it was 8 or 9 years old, right? So <laughs> I, played on, I played on the Judson Jaguars. Yeah. <laughs> we lived on Judson Street, and so I was part of the Judson Jaguars. <laughs> no, we used to play on Saturday mornings, and, you know, you had your own pa- pants, but you didn't have your own shoulder pads or helmets. And so there'd be a series of games, and if you had like the ten o'clock game, the eight o'clock game, they'd wear the pads, and then the nine o'clock game, the eight o'clock kids would take their pads, their shoulder pads, jerseys, and helmets off, and throw them on the ground. And the nine o'clock kids would come and put them on, and then by ten o'clock, you know, you're wearing pads that are pretty well beat up for the day, but you're just throwing on a pair of shoulder pads, a jersey, finding a helmet that fits. We didn't have mouth guards in those days, right. and you're just going out and playing ball, and it was awesome. So your mom must have taken the majority of the brunt. I mean, I've been around you, and I. Play played college football myself, of course, and in the NFL, and that's just a, from a, the head coach or assistant coaches, that's just a very demanding occupation, right? So your mom, she's got, you've got, you've got two other brothers too, right. so it's just not you. No, my mom, Connie, she's always been the anchor. My dad, great dad, obviously, you know, you played for him, so you know how he is, but my mom, she was just the stability in the family, and she worked she sold real estate. She never missed games. She drove us to practice. There was a dinner, you know, waiting for us on the table when we got home. We got home from school. There's a PB and J waiting for us. And yet she still managed to get us to all the CU games. You know, I remember, you know, taking off my pa- pads and, and throwing them down and running to the car and hopping in the car and heading over to Folsom Field to watch the Buffaloes play or running home to watch the Buffaloes on TV or meeting them at the airport on a Saturday night after, after a win and, uh, or sometimes a loss. So yeah, she was, she was the stability. She was amazing and she still is. So now you, your dad gets a job at the University of Washington, right? Yep. And well, we went to UCLA for a year. Okay. That was a really hard move, actually. And I'll tell you what happens, Mark, is that so you're in you're in Boulder, Colorado, and you're, you know, I was uh, 12, I think, 11 or 12, and you wear a certain type of clothes, and you talk a certain way, and you have a certain group of friends, and all of a sudden you're uprooted, and you move to Los Angeles, California, and you don't know what 5 and one jeans are, <laughs> and you don't know what, you know... <laughs> surf lingo and your haircut's different and so that's kind of startling and that's when i first started to notice it and then we were there for a year we moved to seattle and you go to seattle and you'd show up in your five and one jeans with your surfer dude haircut and everyone's wearing swabbies and get theirs and you know it just you kind of feel awkward for a while but my mom was great about helping us assimilate into the kind of culture that we were moving to. So now you end up, you go to Inner Lake High School, right, which is on the east side. If anybody knows the Seattle, greater Seattle area, I grew up on the west side, and Jim went to high school and grew up on the east side. So so now you're going to Inner Lake, and you ended up playing with some, some future Huskies, yep. right? Chris O'Connor, uh, Tom Steve, Flick, Tom Steve Flick, Pluer, yep. yeah, a lot of really good players. Yeah, I actually, I remember you guys were playing in a playoff game, and it was down in Memorial Stadium, and I went down there, and you're playing fullback, I think, or running, running I back. I played running back. I played defensive safety. I was a long snapper. And your dad, at this point, had gone on to the Seattle Seahawks, right? Yes. What was tough for me is that I had always wanted to go back to University of Colorado, You know, in those days, it was different than now. Uh, They didn't really offer you a scholarship until you were a senior. After my senior year, I was preparing to take a trip. They'd they'd asked me to come on an official visit to University of Colorado. And uh, the night before I was supposed to leave, they called and canceled it. So it kind of devastated me because that's where I wanted to go. 
And then I had a couple of small schools that I could have gone to. What happened is my senior year in high school, I hurt my knee. And I didn't get to play most of the year. I, I hurt my ACL. I didn't have to have surgery, but it was sprained. And I missed about six games. So I, I really didn't get to play much. And I just kind of fell off the radar. So I ended up walking on at Washington. I tell this to people all the time. There's another buddy of ours that we're close with, Hugh Millen. And it was interesting because we all three took different paths. I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to the UW. You walked on to the UW. Hugh Millen went down to Santa Rosa JC, ended up coming back, walking on, earned a scholarship, you earned a scholarship, and we all ended up in the same place. Yep. So, you know, sometimes the path isn't always exactly straightforward, no. you know, for everybody. Well, I mean, there's many different paths to success, as you know. It's about your willingness to continue to walk the path. You know, there's this great saying about success and reaching it. It says, my dad gave it to me a long time ago. I keep it on my wallet. It's, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it's about the search for success is never ending. And yeah. the gist of the, and kind of the punchline line is, does the road wind hit wind uphill and yes to the very end and it's like you're always on a mission to succeed if you ever feel like you've gotten there that's when you start to experience failure in my opinion so we all have different paths to success the important thing is that you know our will to get there our willingness to work commit sacrifice invest overcome hardship disappointment i mean i had many disappointments in my life as did you and um and yet, somehow, we found it within ourselves to just continue to take the next step towards our goals. We weren't going to be deterred. Yeah, I think a lot of times what you're talking about is the journey, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right. I know in my case, people who saw me catching the winning touchdown against Michigan or another team or whatnot, they would say, you're so lucky, but they had no idea the hardship that we went through and grinding down in that weight room and running the stairs and all those types of things. And, you know, it just makes you a better person in the in long run. Yep. And so it's also great for you. You're in this great position now as a head coach to impart that knowledge and that wisdom upon guys, especially today, there is so much more immediate gratification that these guys expect, right? Yeah. I mean, every day I have an opportunity to go back into my life and pull something out of it and use it as an example for the players that I coach now at UCLA. And it's not always about football, but it's about life and life experiences. And I think it's always great when a young kid can hear a guy, you know, 55 year old like myself, who now they think is very successful, say, you know, I do understand and then have a an example of why I understand saying, yeah, I get it. I get it. That's one thing. But here's what happened to me in college. You know, I was a walk on. And it was tough. And I remember this one practice where, you know, Coach James was yelling at me and I lost it and I started to cry. So I, I understand where you're coming from. And that's just one example, but there's many. And, and I think that helps me now in what I'm doing with these young men that I deal with every day. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's go back to a story. And I don't know if you're in high school at this point, but your dad now is coaching for the University of Washington in 1977. And in the 1978, technically the same 1977 season, they go to the Rose Bowl. Right. Warren Moon is the quarterback. And I think you got to be the ball boy or I something? I was a ball boy. Yeah, I was a ball boy that year. And so when they played in the Rose Bowl, uh, my brother Michael and I were ball boys in the Rose Bowl. Yeah, so I mean, it's so <laughs> ironic now that you're yeah. the head coach at UCLA and your home field is the Rose Bowl. Well, I've been able to be a ball boy in the Rose Bowl, play in the Rose Bowl, and now I coach in the Rose Bowl Stadium, but we want to win a Rose Bowl. Yeah. I don't think that there's many people who could say that they were a ball boy for a winning Rose Bowl team, played on a winning Rose Bowl team, and coached a winning Rose Bowl team. So that's that's a pretty significant goal for me. Yeah. I remember the only time, considering how far I went in the NFL, that I ever got hurt was when you ran out and you tackled me and you broke my foot. Well, I don't think that's the way the story goes. <laughs> I think I had you covered like a blanket. And as we both went for the ball, and I knocked it away, and uh, you stumbled because you were very unathletic, yeah. and uh, you know I landed on your ankle and broke it. <laughs> that's how mm -hmm. I see the story. Yeah, well, that's that's really interesting <laughs> because you know two people seeing the same yeah. you know, incident in very, very, very different ways. But but anyways, it, it was interesting because it forged our relationship. I think at that point, and so we spent the next four or five years together playing on the team, yeah. and you know it was fun too because winning is fun, and that's what we did back then. And we were good. We we were pretty dominant. We, we were tough and 
We had something special. Yeah. No, it was great. Okay, so now it's my retro fifth year, and you now are a graduate assistant coach. A student right? assistant. A student assistant. I, yeah, I'm I was sorry. still in school, so I was a student assistant. Yep. So now you you do that, and now we go to the Orange Bowl, and now tell us the story how you ended up down in San Diego, because I think it's classic. Well, I had a couple things. Um I had thought about going to USC and, and being a graduate assistant and being in their sports administration uh, school, and Ted Tolner had actually hired me. But I had a dream that I wanted to play. I wanted to coach in the NFL. I wanted to be in the NFL. And I wasn't sure if it was coaching, but I wanted to be in the NFL either as, as an administrator or a coach. So I... Uh, and I, and where, were, where was your dad at this time? My dad was... Uh, he was in New England, I believe, or he might have been in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Stars. At the USFL. Yeah, in the USFL. Okay. But this was before computers, obviously, and so I typed out letters to every general manager in the NFL and every head coach in the NFL, and at that time, there's 28 teams, so 56 letters I typed out and introduced myself and said, you know, I was willing to do anything to get my foot in the door of the NFL, and I got a number of letters back that said, you know, we'll keep your resume on file, but we have nothing now, and so I wrote everyone back again. And uh, said, you know, thank you. Please do keep my resume. And I'm sure they, you know, tossed that right in the wastebasket. But fortunately, one person didn't, and that was Johnny Sanders, who was the general manager of the San Diego Chargers at the time. And Johnny Sanders had coached my dad in the CAF All Star Game here in Southern California when my dad was at University High School. So I think that you and I are, you and I, I know you and I and Hugh were out throwing the ball at the creek on a Friday afternoon. I think you and I were throwing the ball, and Hugh came to the door and he said, hey, there's a guy named Johnny Sanders on the phone for you. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, or no, he said the Chargers are on the phone for you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And just kind of ignored it. He goes, no, I'm serious. So I went on the, picked up the phone. It was Johnny Sanders. He goes, we want to bring you down for an interview. And I was, it was kind of stunning. But uh, I lucked out. I got, a, I got a break and I got a chance to go work for Don Coriel and work with guys like uh, Dan Fouts and, and Charlie Joyner and Kellen Winslow and Ed White, you know, guys that were Hall of Famers. And uh, it was a great way to start my career in the NFL. A lot of what you're talking about, there's a, there's a lot of um, aspiring coaches that may be listening to this, you know, like, hey, it was easy because you had the name, but your dad hadn't established himself no. that much in those days, number one. And number two, it was a lot of persistence. I think there was 28 or 30 teams at the time, and there was 28, yeah. so there's 29 letters. Well, there was 28 letters that went out, of which 27 said thanks but no thanks. Right. Well, there, there was 28 that came back that said thanks but no thanks, <laughs> and then I sent them out again. You know, I just was going to be persistent. And, you know, I did get a break, but after you get the break, you still have to make your own way. It doesn't matter who you are or what your reputation is, is you still have to forge your own path. So while I had the same name as my dad, and that helped me get in the door, I still believe it was my work ethic that kept me there and allowed me to continue to progress up the coaching ladder. You know, when I went to San Diego, it was my goal that every single day I was going to be the first one in the office and I was never going to leave before everyone else had left. I was going to be the last one out. I was going to learn how to do everything. I was going to get a key to everything. I can remember it was like I was going to monopolize information so that I made myself invaluable. They had to have me. Remember when we got a new copy machine and uh, no one knew, knew how to use it except me. And I would not teach anybody how to use it because I needed them to have to have me there to make copies for them. Yeah, or when smart. computers started, you know, we started to use computers, I'd never even seen a computer. And I remember uh, Al Saunders, who's the uh, offensive coordinator, goes, Jimmy, do you know how to use a computer? I'm like, absolutely. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, okay, you're the computer guy. Right. Great. I'm the computer guy. And, you know, for the next two weeks, I just stayed up all night trying to teach myself how to use a computer. Yeah. So it was just things like that that I think make the difference. It's being willing to do the work and show the commitment and put in the time and not just do it every once in a while, but do it every single day. That's how you become successful. There's a guy on your staff right now that I think reminds me or reminds, must remind you of you a little bit. Scott White, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Scotty's a great story. So similar type deal, right? So share that with us. Scotty played at Washington, and then he uh, he didn't make it in the NFL, and um, he took some small college jobs, some high school jobs, kind of uh, you know worked around different places, but was having trouble finding his way to the uh, Division One level. Rick Neuheisel 
brought him in as a volunteer. Scotty was one of those guys that would just stay around all day, all night working. People don't know this, but he slept in the locker room or his car when he had one. He made no money. He ate at the training table. He, you know, he worked a second job. When I got the job, I kept him on as an intern. Really didn't pay him anything. He continued to stay in the. We had a players' lounge. He'd sleep in the players' lounge. And I, I noticed him, but I really didn't get to know him until probably the second year that I was there. And I just said, this guy's like, he's good. He's always around. He always has the answers. He never says no. He always says yes. If you give him a project and you have an idea of how you want it to be done, it's always done better than you expected. Um, he's dependable. The players respond to him. You can just count on him to be there when you need him. And that's why I started watching him more and watching him on the field and watching how he interacted with the players and his knowledge of the game. And you know, he's always watching film and always talking to people about how to how to reach the players in a different way and coach and teach and things that need to be emphasized and you know now he's my linebacker coach and special teams coordinator and it's just great to see a guy that was willing to make those sacrifices and make that investment and it's paying off for him because he's going to be a I mean I think he'll be a head coach someday yeah he's got that definitely he's got that um, same mentality it was never handed to him no no he had to earn it right everyone you have to earn real success you have to earn yeah in my opinion. I mean, you know, the, people can hand you things, but if you want self-satisfaction, if you want to be gratified personally, you have to go earn it. You have to earn it. You have to put the work in. That's when you feel like you've achieved something, when it's hard. If it's easy, it's easy. You want it hard. So speaking of earning it, the name of this podcast is Finding Your Summit. So everybody has a different version. So it's really metaphorically speaking, right? So it could be in business, it could be in coaching, it could be in climbing mountains or, you know, whatever your, whatever your thing is, right? So let's go back to you're in San Diego, and we're going to kind of work our way up to now you're a head coach in Atlanta, Okay, right? So now you're in San Diego, and now you have an opportunity to go where? It was in San Francisco? No. I had been through three head coaches in San Diego, and every time one got fired, I'd moved up. And uh, the last guy to get fired was a guy named Dan Henning, and now I was out of a job. And I had an opportunity to go to the Cincinnati Bengals, with David Shula, and I decided to pass that up to go to the New Orleans Saints and work with my dad. Mm, that's right. I'd been in the NFL for eight, eight years, so I felt like I had the credibility that I could go and work for my dad now, and people wouldn't think it was nepotism. So I went to uh, New Orleans for five years, and from there I went to San Francisco, which was a great place to be and you know, a tremendous tradition, a great standard of excellence around – you know, multiple Hall of Fame players, some of the greatest that ever played the game. Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh. I, you know, I, I was mentored by Bill Walsh. I'd go sit in his office almost every day and talk to him about things, have him come to my meetings and evaluate, you know, my teaching style and how I could better reach the players. Became the defensive coordinator there and then was fortunate to get the opportunity to be the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, so now we're down in, now you're down in, I should say, we, we now you're down in. You were there a lot. I was down there I was, but... Um, so the thing that was, was great is when you called me and say, hey, I just got the head coach. I was so excited for you because kind of once you hit that level, you typically get a couple chances no matter how it goes. Right. It just seems like that's kind of the, the whole formula. And I remember going down there. You invited me down there to go to a game. And this is after you got your feet wet and, you know, you had your camps going and, and your coaching staff picked. And, and now we're into the season. And we ended up going to a Carlos Santana concert, yep. right? Right in the middle of uh, <laughs> City Atlanta. Park, yeah. City Park, yeah. And the thing that was bizarre to me is um, we were sitting there. We had great seats. And we turned to each other and we're like, hey, let's get some beers. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, you need to go get them. I'm like, what are you talking about? You go get them. He goes, you don't understand. I go, what do you mean? You're right. I don't understand. <laughs> help me understand that and the south is just so much different and you were so recognizable that you couldn't get from point a to point b without being mobbed and there was just a, like an eye opener for me it's just like well it's okay. different it's it, you know i don't like that stuff as you know but yeah. it, that's the way it is in the south and you know we went in there and we had immediate success we took over a 5 and 11 team and went 11 and 5 and went to the nfc championship game my first year so you know you're this 40 year old guy and Everyone thinks you're the the savior. You know, it's been forever since they've been to the playoffs, and there's not a lot that they're more interested in down there than the Falcons. And so, 
people always wanted a piece of you. And that was tough on me because I'm such a family guy that I couldn't even take my kids to the grocery store or to the mall or to a game without them having to stand off to the side while I signed autographs for an hour. You know, now it's just part of the deal, but it was so what, what, awkward what, part of but, the deal but, for but, me. But outside of just being, you're saying, you know, you didn't like it. What was that like? I mean, like, you're one day, you're... We're us, right? And the next day, your your face is recognized everywhere you go. Well, it didn't change me. I understand that, but... You know that. I mean, it's never changed me. I don't like it, first of all, but I do it because I think it's part of the job. And I think if you're in a position where you have a platform and people want to meet you and they think it's neat, then... You know, I'm lucky. I'm I'm blessed to have the jobs that I've had, so I think it's okay to spend some time with people. But the contradiction was the time it took away from the family. I just tried to stay as humble as possible and not think that I was all that because people want to autograph. I realized that it could have been, you know, this book of matches. That if that had been the head coach and they'd gone eleven five, they'd want the book of matches to sign autographs. It wasn't necessarily me. It was just the position of head coach. Right. And being in the South, they I think and they, the South's different. No, the South the is South, different. Football is football is a real deal in the South. Yeah. I mean, it's just you know it's different down there. You spend time in New Orleans. I mean, it's like a religious experience for them. It's amazing. I mean, they go to church on Sunday, then they go to the games, and that's what they do. So now you you have immediate success there, and you're down there for three years, and then it seems like every head coach ultimately it ends it either ends great which is not very many people or it ends you know it it ends right yeah. and so i know that was a very difficult transition for you but you know you you talk about your summits and it's not all about going up because sometimes you gotta go down to, you go, back go, down up. to go back up yeah. so that kind of happened with you and there was a relationship you had with the uh the the gm in in seattle and so you ended up i had moved to Seattle from Santa Monica, so it was great for me and great, I think, for the Seattle community. But, you know, here you, you're a, you're a hometown kid that what we considered you. You know, I know you didn't get there till high school or something, but um, now you end up back in Seattle and you're with the Seahawks. Right. Well, I had a chance to be the head coach of the Miami Dolphins after I got fired in Atlanta, but I chose to come back to Seattle because that was home for me. I, I moved there when I was 12. I did not want to raise my kids in uh, South Florida. I wanted to raise them in the Pacific Northwest, which I still consider home. So I took a job with the Seahawks as the assistant head coach and defensive back coach, and uh, was very happy. You know, it was actually a relief to not be the head coach for a while, but I still wanted to have another opportunity to be a head coach. So I had that opportunity. I had an opportunity with the Washington Redskins. Went back and and spent time with Dan Snyder, was offered that job, but at the same time, the Seahawks, Mike Holmgren decided that he was going to coach one more year and retire, so the Seahawks made me the head coach in waiting, which, looking back on it, was probably the worst decision I've ever made, to stay there as the head coach in waiting and follow Mike Holmgren. It just, it it didn't work out right. Well... Yeah, I mean, you look back in past history too, and you know, there's not many guys who have followed the ha- Hall of Fame coach to come in and have immediate success and keep that torch going. I mean, it's just yeah. such a hard thing, and people's expectations are so high. Yeah, well, he's that, not a Hall of Fame coach, and he won't be a Hall of Fame coach, but he's a damn good coach. Well, he'd been to a Super Bowl, right? And yeah, so, he'd won a Super Bowl. yeah, and the way that people looked at him yeah. in a certain way up there. So that but was they they won four games the year before. I improved his record and still got fired. You know, it was yeah. just a weird deal. So Yeah. So, you know, it's just I, I do believe though that that sets you up to what I believe is kind of your life's calling. I agree. Right? Every action has a reaction and um you're right. Getting fired in Seattle was the hardest thing that I had experienced because I felt like I'd let my hometown down. But also led me to where I believe, as you just said, I should be, which is coaching college football at UCLA. And um, you know, I took the two years after I got fired. I worked in television, as you know, and I blew up my knee skiing with you yep. um, at Crystal Mountain. Great story about that. <laughs> If we want to go into that, I, I'll well, just uh, ask your listeners this. Like, I, I won't. I won't even give them the punchline. Two guys go skiing. They're both really good skiers, okay? One guy blows out his ACL, all right? And one guy goes down the mountain in a toboggan. Are they the same guy? Yeah, and we'll just point so it out. we can so. just leave it right there. <laughs> but anyway, so I had the chance to spend about six months, five days a week, three hours a day, six months at the University of Washington with, when Steve Sarkeesian was the head coach. And they kind of opened their doors to me. I was over there rehabbing my knee, and they opened their doors and said, hey, you can come in and learn the college game. And 
I found myself really drawn to the college athlete. You know, I'd be in the training room. The p- football players were in there, the basketball players, the women's and men's volleyball players, the swimmers, the gymnasts, you, you name it. They were all coming through there, and they knew who I was because I'd been the head coach at Seattle. I'd played at Washington, and they'd start to ask me kind of life questions, and it felt good to be able to, in a way, mentor them. And so I realized very quickly that where I should be, where I where I belonged, where I could have the most impact and feel probably the most gratification was coaching in college. And I was lucky to get the UCLA job. Yeah. We had talked about this before when you're in that, that space between the Seahawks and, you know, that was a hard time for you. Yeah, it and, was. Um, I always felt, Hugh Millen always felt, our good buddy who played in the NFL for 10 years, that your best talents were most served in the college game for a couple of reasons. Number one, the NFL head coaching gig is very transient, right? So yeah. people are lucky to get, I think the average is something like 2.5 years or something. <laughs> yeah, it's that, right? So it's not very long. That's number one. Number two is the way that you can part your knowledge, the way you communicate with really everybody. It's the guy that doesn't have a lot of money, comes from a rough neighborhood to the, you know, mid-American, you know, type guy to the guy from the affluent uh, communities. You know, you just have a certain way that you can really relate to that guy. And I think it really showed the first year he came down and you ended up with something like the number 12 class, you know, and this is a guy, you, who had never recruited and you had to assemble a, a coaching staff together, hit the ground running, go out, recruit. I mean, it was crazy, your timeline, to make all that happen. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things Bill Walsh said about me publicly that probably I'm most proud of is he made a comment once that he'd never been around somebody that was more comfortable with the contemporary athlete than I was. And I think what he meant by that was the, being able to handle the diversity, race, religion, socioeconomic background, political beliefs, all of those things. You know, I kind of have, as you know, the ability to, to talk to anybody on their level and do it comfortably. So I think that transcends well into college football because you're dealing with kids that a lot of times come from nothing, single parent households, sometimes no parent households, raised by maybe their grandma. You know, they've had to struggle to survive and they're not very trusting sometimes. So you have to earn their trust. And I've just been lucky that for some reason, I have an understanding, an innate understanding of how to build that trust with those guys. So now you're going into your sixth year right. here at UCLA. So what would you say is your craziest recruiting experience where you, oh. you, you, know, you beamed into somebody's house and it was just, whether it was their house, the environment, or, or what happened? Well, there's just many. I can't even tell you what the most bizarre one is because I've been in some situations that it would be hard for people to conceive. You know, I've been in the South in homes where people actually had dirt floors and they might throw some linoleum over the dirt floor and uh, not to exaggerate where they'd have to go outside to the outhouse to use the bathroom. I mean, I've Hmm. been to those places. I've been here in in South Central Los Angeles where, and you've been with me, where, you know, I kind of had to get permission to go into the neighborhood, you know, a hood pass essentially is what they call it, you know, and they had to know I was coming. Or, you know, or one of the, son, some what, yeah, you know, one guy of the, that looks like me driving in. It's like, what's this What's this guy doing here? You know, so you, you know, we went to the, the football game. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> one of those guys you might be talking about. And again, you know, for people, this is kind of part of your life. But, you know, for most people, they don't get this exposure. But you went over and had a chat with uh, Snoop Dogg, right? Yeah, I've been to Snoop's place. Yeah. You know, I've been... I've been in every little cranny of L.A., and sometimes it's great places, sometimes it's, you know, daunting and dangerous places, but there's great kids everywhere. And what I've found is that you can find really good people and really good players and and, and uh, motivated, respectful people everywhere. You just have to sometimes give them a chance. You know, I think we're too quick to judge sometimes, and unless you've lived in a man's shoes, it's hard to understand, you know, why he is the way he is. You know, a great story is Tack McKinley, you yep. know, and who just was drafted in the first round by the Atlanta Falcons. And, Defensive lineman. Yeah, and people had kind of given up on Tack, and he'd gone to a junior college, and this is a young man that his mother, we never knew his father. His, his mother disappeared at age five. He was raised by his grandmother. His grandmother and him used to have to collect cans and bottles in order to, to eat. Oftentimes he was homeless, or they were staying on friends' couches. 
or if they were lucky enough to scrape enough money together, they could live in an apartment. His grandmother died when he was 18, and he made her a promise that, you know, he'd go to a Division One school and he'd make it to the NFL, and he did. And it was just amazing to see him fulfill his promise at the draft in Philadelphia last year. This is a kid that had not slept in a bed until he got to UCLA. So the first few nights at UCLA, he would take his covers and his pillow off the bed and put it on the floor where he felt more comfortable. Hmm. Got a guy coming in this year from Nigeria who, when he was a youngster, was kidnapped by the rebel, the militants. They called them the militants. I thought it was Boko Haram, but it wasn't. It was the militants. He saw his very be- at age 12, his very best friend was beheaded right in front of him for trying to escape from the militants, who'd never slept in a bed until he got to the United States. You know, I mean, there's just, I mean, there's story after story after story after story like that. You know, I have a, a kid coming in this year from the Ivory Coast who moved to Philadelphia when he was seven. Uh, he was put into uh, high school when he was 12. Because he's so big, you know, it's kind of a blindside story. Yep. Uh, just amazing stories, and it's kind of the human will to succeed. And I just love having the opportunity to be in their lives and help. I know what their goals are, and having the chance to help them reach those goals. And sometimes that means some tough love with some of these kids. You know, sometimes you have to, as you know, you have to get on them. You have yeah. to hold them accountable because they start to get in their comfort zone a little bit, and they forget what they are after and where they came from. And But you have to have built that trust up so that when you do hold them accountable, they understand that it's coming from a place of love. Yeah. That, it, to me, that, that really you know showed through with a guy like Tack, right, mm-hmm. who is a super intense, emotional guy on the field, and he needed to be able to trust somebody in authority, which was you. And I thought you did a fantastic job of really trying to let him be him, but at the same time within the, the guidelines of team rules. It's hard. There's a balance there. And it's it's really difficult in college because uh, you have to teach them about standards and you have to teach them about accountability. And yet you have to find a way to let them be individuals, but individuals within the, within the framework of the team. And that's not always easy. And, uh, in the NFL, you can kind of err on the side of letting them be individuals. In high college, you have to err on the side of making sure they're members of the team, part of the team. Mm. I just have a lot of one-on-one conversations with these guys, and I can draw on my experience in the NFL. I can draw on all the experiences I've had with players through the years to try to help them through any misunderstandings or help them understand why things are the way they are, why they're being asked to do what they're asked to do, why they need to conform, what NFL teams are looking for, because they all come to the to the UCLA football program with the dream of playing in the NFL, why their education is important, because as you know, your NFL career or your college career can end at any time, and you make sure that these kids are taking advantage of every opportunity to be successful on and off the field. Mm-hmm. So... I've got this module that I've created called the Seven Summits of Success. And so when we talk about the word summits, it's a acronym for accomplishment, okay? So S is for C, that's your idea, and then you unleash it, then you move it, then you measure it, you improve it, and then you traverse it, okay, before you hit your S, which is your summit, and you, know, you pay it forward, right? And um, last year, due to a lot of reasons, you guys didn't have this kind of season that you wanted to have, right? So there was a lot of adversity that you had to go through, right? And, of course, just the nature of being in the public eye and whatnot, people are chirping like, you know. (laughs) They're critical. They're critical, right? It's just the nature of the beast, right? It is. (laughs) But I felt like one of the things that you did, which was really really difficult i know for you is that many of the guys on your offensive side of the ball ended up going someplace else and and you brought in you know new staff and and so i I really just want to talk about really quickly about voices new voices and i think it's so important and i think that the guys that you brought in have the street cred and i think they've got they're brilliant and i think you guys are going to take from where you were last year a healthy quarterback healthy line great defense and you're going to have the kind of season i believe that you probably thought you're going to have last year I hope so. You know, I'm very loyal, so anytime it comes time to make a change on my staff, it's really hard for me, but I also have that responsibility as a head coach to make sure that we're always moving in the right direction. So, you know, I had to make some difficult choices. I was very lucky to be able to hire some some players that are fantastic, or some coaches that are fantastic, and have done a great job of relating to our players, are very, very great coaches, former NFL players, a lot of great pedigree, 
Um, so I'm excited about the year. But the most important thing, I think, is that we are back to having the type of culture amongst our team that's important to success. I was saying that culture precedes success. Language dictates culture, and leaders determine language. And mm-hmm. right now, we have that. We have leaders that are talking the right way. And that language is creating a certain culture, and that certain culture is going to lead to us having success. And that's what I'm excited about. We're all on the same page, moving in the same direction, and we have an opportunity to, to capitalize on some of this momentum we've, we've built. So you have a you have a quarterback that's coming back that was hurt most of the year, Josh Rosen. His progress this last spring? Uh, outstanding. Josh got hurt last year uh, in the fifth game, and he had to sit and watch. I had a great talk with him the other day. He just he was probably the worst and the best thing that ever happened to him. He was kind of always the golden boy, you know, the anointed one. And uh, all of a sudden, things got really tough on him, and he went to a dark place. But he came out of it, and he realized that he needed to change his approach and his attitude, and that would help him have success. He'd, I think he'd taken things for granted. And now, all of a sudden, it was taken away from him, and he realized how much he loved playing football and loved being a quarterback and loved being a part of a team and loved the respect that comes with it and he's embraced all of the things that are necessary to get back to being a great player and now it's not just because he's highly skilled it's because he understands all the other things that go into being successful the hard work the commitment the sacrifice the effort you know all of those things the investment you have to make you you said all those words and it's it's awesome and it reminds me again of you going through your patch between not knowing if you're going to coach again. You wanted to, yeah. but didn't know what your path was going to be after the Seahawks gig. And really taking a step back, being humbled a little bit, and really getting that fire back so that when you were in the position again, you put yourself in a position to be out talking to teams like UCLA. You know, you had all the ammo ready to go. You had a book. You had a game plan. And so when you hit the ground running, you know, you were going at full pace. And that's all about preparation meets opportunity, yep. right? Absolutely. I mean, you, you, my dad used to always tell me, just do the best you can do where you are at that moment. And certainly you're preparing for, for other things, but don't always be looking to the future. Just do the best you can. And then the off season, spend some time and, and, and study and talk to people and research, but don't be a social climber. Don't try to climb the ladder too fast, but do as best great a job as you can where you are in that moment and then you will get your opportunities and i believe in that you know i also believe in that you know as you said like you know finding your summit there's no summit there's no summit and you said it the summit shifts when you get to the summit you reach your goal you immediately need to set a new goal it's like when you if you set a standard and you reach that standard then it's time to reset the standard if you ever feel like you're at the top then you know, it's a quick slide to the bottom, as you know. Yeah. So it's always about, to me, setting goals, never feeling like you've made it, readjusting those goals as you go, but never feeling like you've you've found the the summit. The summit's elusive, and that's what makes it so awesome. Is it's elusive? Is your you, the great people are always in search of it. Well, one of the things that you talk about is summit, and I know you're ta- not talking about this way, but for those people that don't know. Jim Mora and I were invited to be a part of Chris Long's Water Boy, which is raising money to build water wells down in Tanzania for the people of the Maasai tribe. And we got to go down there. We got to, number one, we raised money and we kicked butt in terms of the amount of money we were asked to raise in terms of actually funding our own well, which was, you know, really inspirational. Number two, and we were grateful too at the same time for the people that donated to this great cause. And number two, we actually got to go down and go to these villages. And I know it had a huge impact on me, and it had a huge impact on you. And we talked about that. And, you know, we take it for granted. We're here in Los Angeles, and there's nice cars and houses in the ocean and all these beautiful things around. And down there, it's just we're talking about putting in a faucet, which changes their life. Water is life, and that's their big saying down there. So I don't know, it, it just, it had a profound effect on me. And, and then you and I went and climbed uh, the mountain Kilimanjaro with the other six NFL guys in Green Berets. And just that whole experience of just putting life in perspective of the bigger picture of where we're trying to go and accomplish things in life. I don't know. I really just took it down to its core for me. Me too. I mean, it, it, we live in a bubble. 
it's great to get outside that bubble and see what it's really like. And you're right. I wouldn't say it was life changing. It was life altering to see really how simple it was to help someone else, you know, to make an, an impact on somebody else in a very, very profound way. And life changing not just moment changing where they had instant gratification but this is life changing stuff that we we're doing for these people yeah and that was really cool and uh i had a f- another great opportunity to go to iraq on a uso tour and it was the same type of thing you know you're over there and you're seeing these soldiers and they're thanking you for coming guy i thank you for being here thank you for being here you're like no 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 thank you for what you're doing they're living in containers they're getting shot at every day they're thousands and thousands of miles away from their families so you know we've been lucky because being in sports it allows us a chance to do some of these really unique things and serve other people well not only that but i think i was so grateful to be part of that because i'm not a coach and you put yourself through hard work and dedication in a position to be that change agent for all these guys we're talking about that you go out and recruit and come to UCLA. And what a what a wonderful gift you've been able to give those guys. It's the best. It's the coaching part, the winning the games, that's fantastic. But it goes away. When the game's over, everyone starts talking about the next game and you have to win that. But when you know that you impacted a life and changed it forever or changed the direction of a family forever because you gave someone an opportunity and then you held them accountable to that opportunity and then those people come back, those kids come back and they thank you years later, then you know that you're doing the right thing. Yeah, that's, that's just awesome. You know you're doing the right thing. I am pumped up for this year. I'm super thankful and grateful that you've allowed me to go on all the road trips with UCLA and the way that UCLA family has embraced me in terms of uh, just respecting who I am and letting me kind of go and can't even come in inside <laughs> the, the locker room and on the field and all those things. It's, it's amazing. I mean, who else gets to do that? So it's a wonderful gift for me. But for all those people out there, Jim Moore, quality guy, class act, best friend, and I just think there's great things ahead for you where you're taking this program and, and again, the kind of um, you know leadership that you can give to all these different kids that come to your, to your school. Well, thanks. I mean, it's been fun. And it's, as you said, best friends. When you're experiencing the things in life that you like to do and you're getting to do it with someone that you're close to, we've known each other, we met when we were seniors in high school, that's what makes it pretty special when you're doing it alone you're walking the journey alone it's uh it's okay when you get to do it with someone that you care about that's what makes it really special too well my mom is down here from seattle and she's sitting across the table right now and she's a cheerleader yeah she was a cheerleader up there for the u-dub so we'll get her down here on the sideline and (laughs) get her in a bruin i don't know she might run out on the field and tackle somebody (laughs) (laughs) no one pam patterson Uh, that's right she's got some fight in her we know that so hey listen i i totally appreciate this this has been amazing we're here in beautiful sunny southern california you know outside on a Friday afternoon doing this. So great appreciation. Thank you. And uh, we'll do this again. Okay. Absolutely. My pleasure. It was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. If you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts. It takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. Bye.